And the next speaker, uh, Kashru, he will tell us a few comments on anti-brains. Please. Is that better? Great. So, so uh, let me join the other speakers in thanking the organizers for, for organizing this conference in this wonderful venue and for giving me a chance to speak. So I'm going to talk about um, various things to do with anti-brains. And to the extent that there's anything novel in my talk, it will be based on two papers from March, one with McAllister and Sundrum, and one with Arguello, Bertolini, and Franco. OK, so, so we've already heard the construction of, uh, of metastable string vacua uh, which breaks supersymmetry, uh, is a problem of significant interest for, for many reasons, and I can't go through all of them, but there are two that are really central in, in my view right now. Uh, one is, because of the last 10 years of development in ADS, CFT, and gauge gravity duality, we have new techniques that can teach us about strong coupling dynamics and field theory, and hence about SUSY breaking models that are hard to understand directly in weakly coupled quantum field theory, and may exhibit new dyna dynamical features. Uh, that is, the models are in some sense stringy. And a second reason, much more optimistic uh, and maybe unlikely, is that some of these models, if they really have new features, uh, could be relevant for LHC-related model building. And I'll try to illustrate both of these possibilities in my talk. The first half will kind of be a review of an old paper with Pearson and Berlinda, and then I'll get to the new work. Okay, so the simplest and most explicit example of a a gravity duel for a confining gauge theory was mentioned by Mike also. It's the warp deform conifold solution. So the starting point is the singular conifold geometry, which arises in many Calabi-Aus locally. It's uh, this quadratic, oops, quadratic equation in four variables. And the singularity can be viewed as a cone uh, whose base is S3 times S2. And there are at least two interesting gauge gravity dualities associated uh, with this geometry. So the first is, you can imagine putting ND3 brains at the tip of the cone. If they were away from the tip at a smooth point, of course, taking the near horizon limit would give us Maldacena's famous N equals 4 example of ADS-CFT duality. When they're at the tip, uh, you instead find a near horizon geometry that's different. It's of the form ADS5 cross T11. And the metric in 5 form are known explicitly. Uh, the metric is of the standard harmonic function form, where the harmonic function, for all intents and purposes, looks like uh, Maldacena's original example. It's gn over r to the fourth. And the five form is determined by the same harmonic function. Now, Kleberov and Witten studied this theory many years ago and conjectured that it's dual to a conformally invariant field theory whose gauge group has uh, two group elements, uh, two, two factors, sun times sun, so the ranks in that quiver are equal, and whose superpotential consists of the unique SU2 times SU2 invariant uh, single trace operator that you can make out of uh, those combinations of two by fundamentals going in each direction. So that theory is conformal and won't be useful for our purposes, but a small modification of it, studied in great detail by Klebanov and Strassler, and in a rather different way by Vatha, uh, will be useful for our purposes. So these authors considered breaking conformal invariants by adding some number of D5 brains wrapping the shrinking S2 at the tip of the conifold. Now, then you get the general quiver there with R1 not equal to R2. And the theory is no longer conformally invariant. While the large R behavior, or the field theory UV behavior, of the gravity solution is, at least in an M over N expansion, uh, the same as before. It's governed by the same CFT in an M over N expansion. Uh, the infrared behavior is very different and in fact is very similar to pure Yang-Mills theory uh, with n equals 1 supersymmetry. So it's useful to think of this modified solution in terms of not the conifold, but the deformed conifold geometry, where this singular tip has been smoothed out by turning on a finite value of the parameter epsilon deforming the equation. Now this geometry has two interesting three cycles in it. One is obvious if you just take the variables on the left to all be real, you see that there's a three sphere of size epsilon. Maybe you have to rotate the phase of epsilon. Uh, and we'll call that the A cycle. And the other three cycle is its, its natural symplectic dual, which is swept out by taking the two sphere uh, in the base of the cone and transporting it along the radial direction uh, in the space time. 
Now, if the original n of the theory is a product of two integers, k times m, we can think of the modified geometry of Klebanov and Strassler as being sourced by uh, certain three-form fluxes in the 2B supergravity, uh, m units piercing the A cycle, where m was the number of D5 brains, and k units of NS flux piercing the B cycle. Now, we can use the standard conifold periods, probably worked out first in this context by Candelas and Dilasa and others years ago, that say that basically the A period of omega measures the size of the three sphere, so Z is related to epsilon by a simple formula. Well, the B period has a logarithmic singularity that gives the required monogamy. And if we plug this into the GVW superpotential, um, you'll find a potential for the one complex structure modulus in this problem, namely Z. Uh, and the solution is that Z, or equivalently epsilon, uh, is stabilized at an exponentially small value, okay, e to the minus pi k over gm. So for order one flux quanta, you get an exponentially small number out. The metric at the tip uh, of this space in the gravity duel was determined by Klebanov et al. And it's actually quite trivial. Uh, it's basically the form of Minkowski space times uh, this metric, where you see that the two-sphere size is multiplied by r squared. So as r goes to zero, the two-sphere shrinks to zero size, and you're left with a smooth geometry, which is a S3, whose size goes like gm, and a Minkowski factor, which has been warped by the exponentially small number a0. So there b0 is some number of order one that won't matter for us. So in addition to the metric, there are fluxes, and the most relevant flux at the tip is the one that was piercing the finite-sized S3. Uh, it has m units of flux through the S3. The S3 is large, so roughly that flux takes the form of some number times the volume element on the S3, and that number, or equivalently the flux density, dilutes in the supergravity limit. So at large gm, little f actually becomes small, so the solution is smooth and well-controlled. Now, this solution is supersymmetric, and it carries n units of D3 brain charge. But an important and interesting fact about it is that there are no explicit D3 brains anywhere in the solution. The charge all comes from the flux. So if one wishes to break supersymmetry in this solution, there's an obvious thing that you can do without in introducing any obvious instability, which is just to add some number p, uh, which is much smaller than m and n, of antibrains. Uh, which we considered with those authors. Now, for p small compared to m and n, one expects a systematic p over n or p over m expansion, and so one should be able to treat the solution perturbatively. The resulting theory has slightly different d3 charge. Instead of the n or k times m units carried by the flux, it now has km minus p units. And that, in fact, matches that of a supersymmetric theory, one with one less unit of never schwartz flux but with m minus p supersymmetric D3 probes moving on their moduli space in the geometry. Now that latter state is supersymmetric. So probably one should think of these anti-D3 brains as describing some kind of state, stable or unstable, as we'll discuss, uh, in this supersymmetric theory. Now to really justify this interpretation, one should worry about the full asymptotics of the cascading solution with the supersymmetric boundary conditions and try to interpret the non-supersymmetric states via ADS-CFT. And I haven't done that carefully, but we're doing it now. But in any case, in the probe approximation, the dynamics of the anti-D3s is as follows. Firstly, because there are n units of D3 charge sourcing the geometry, uh, the anti-brains are attracted to the D3 brains, meaning they're attracted to the infrared end of the geometry by the five-form flux. They couple electrically to C4, and the five-form flux sucks them to the tip of the warp-deformed conifold. Now, once they're there, they don't just sit there happily breaking supersymmetry because they're transverse to a non-zero Ramon Ramon flux. And Myers taught us that in the presence of a transverse Ramon flux, to which they don't couple electrically, uh, many brains undergo the so-called Myers effect. They blow up or polarize into objects that carry dipole or higher multiple moment charges uh, of the related gauge field. So in this particular case, at least in one regime of parameters, what happens is that the anti-brains polarize into a five-brain that wraps a two-sphere within the three-sphere that remains a finite size at the tip. But more precisely, if you plug in the background Ramon Ramon and Nevo Schwartz fields determined by Klebanov et al. Uh, into the born enfeld and Simons action, what you'll find 
is there's an effective potential for the brain scalar modes phi. The leading term in that effective potential is just the brain tension. You'll notice that it's exponentially small. That's because of the warp factor and indicates that these states will have exponentially small Susie breaking scale. There's the familiar quartic term, the trace squared of phi i phi j, uh, which you're familiar with from the n equals 4 theory that a D3 brain would experience away from the tip. And there's a cubic term, which is new, which is due to the flux, and which cancels for brains, but is felt by antibrains. So if you try to find critical points of this potential, it's the work of a moment to see that if you want uh, constant field configurations, one simple way to get solutions is to take phi to be a matrix which satisfies those commutation relations where i, j, and k are indices parametrizing the three sphere. Now, I should say you have to really rescale that to get a coefficient of one or two there, but the rescaling you can do is an inhomogeneous equation. And in fact, these are precisely the commutation relations for a p-dimensional matrix representation of SU2. So the critical points of this system are in one-to-one -one correspondence with generally reducible SU2 representations whose total dimension adds up to P. And the solution with lowest energy is the p-dimensional irrep. That you actually work out by plugging in and computing the energy in terms of casimirs. Now intuitively, let me just describe what's happening. Uh, this anti-D3 brain goes to the end of the geometry and blows up into a five brain wrapping a two sphere. And for P much less than M, this is in fact a metastable state. The two sphere can be large, but much smaller than the equator of the geometry, so supergravity applies, and it has to decay non-protributively to the supersymmetric states with the same boundary conditions that I described before. And one can in fact write down the instanton of false vacuum decay. As P grows closer to M, uh, the dividing line is actually numerically about M over 10, uh, this two-sphere that the three-brain is wrapping grows larger and larger. Of course, the largest two-sphere you can find in a three-sphere is the equator of the three-sphere. And about the time when the, those sizes begin to coincide, in the full string theory, one finds an instability of the configuration, and even perturbatively, these states are unstable. So the summary of my review is that for P much less than M and N, the system of P anti-brains in this warp deform conifold gives rise to metastable, non-supersymmetric states with some exponentially small vacuum energy. Now, in the last year or so, I've been revisiting these states because of two natural questions. One is, in a surprising and beautiful paper uh, last year, in Gator, Seiberg, and Xi discovered that very simple vector-like supersymmetric quantum field theories, uh, for instance, SUSY QCD with, with very light flavors, uh, can have metastable SUSY breaking vacua. Now, if you go back and look at the conifold quivers and some relatives I'll mention, um, these give very QCD-like theories, where the difference is that one has gauged the flavor groups. So the flavors of one node actually transform under what would be flavor groups of a QCD theory. Um, are there cases, then, where these anti-D states at large GN, which show up in the conifold quiver, are present in a theory that has the ISS vacua, whose field theory we, we understand much better, at small GN? And a second question I have is that it's very easy to compactify this situation uh, by making Calabi owls that contain a conifold and so forth, um, and then use this as a method of breaking supersymmetry in a compact Calabi owl. Um, are there novel features in the way that this SUSY breaking at the end of such a throat would be communicated to brains in the bulk? What would they see in terms of soft breaking parameters? So um, let me move on to the, the first new work done with those collaborators. And I should say, if one's goal is to engineer ISS, we were far from the first to do that. Uh, a list of groups that made related theories is given there. So anyway, um, this, this chaos field theory itself, if you analyze its gauge dynamics, does not have evident metastable vacua weak gauge coupling. Maybe there's a trick of strong coupling dynamics we don't understand yet that would unveil them, but at least I haven't been able to find them. Uh, but simple generalizations of it do. So, we need to add a parameter to generalize the theory. And one obvious thing you can do to a quiver is you can orbifold or orientifold it. So there are just very simple ZK quotients of the conifold whose quiver diagrams take the following form. They were studied first by Uranga, as far as I know. Uh, this is for K equals three. Uh, it's just a circular quiver with two arrows going back and forth each way. You can say, see that the degenerate limit of K equals one gives you uh, the conifold quiver. And for general K, there are two K nodes. Now, the superpotential here takes the form of a quartic, uh, which connects 
uh, pairs of adjacent nodes in the obvious way. And because it's a quartic, if you want to view this as a weakly coupled theory, H is a dimensionful parameter, which you should think of as one over the string scale or one over the warped string scale. Now, for suitable choices of the gauge groups, uh, the occupation numbers of these nodes, um, these non-chiral theories also have RG cascades and simple gravity duals, uh, which are somewhat similar to the original example. And the simplest model of this sort, uh, which seems to have stable, or at least metastable states, of massive QCD, uh, or similar to the ones in massive QCD, is, is the model I've drawn there, the K equals 3 model, but where one doesn't need to use all of the nodes. So of those six nodes, uh, one needs to occupy four, and we should choose occupation numbers as written there, suggestively called NC, 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 and 1. So the superpotential takes the form of the various quartic terms one could write down. And I've added a mass term there, and I'll explain its origin momentarily. Now, in the regime where the dynamical gauge couplings, or the sizes of cycles in the geometry, are chosen so that lambda 3 is the largest coupling, lambda 2 is tiny, and lambda 1 is slightly larger, this theory is basically the SUSY QCD theory with SUNC gauge group and NC plus 1 flavors at node 3. And you can analyze it by standard field theory techniques. Um, now, the other nodes are there for a reason that you'll see. They're either flavor nodes to generate the flavors of the real group or to dynamically generate the needed light quark masses because I'd like to avoid the fine tuning that goes into considering QCD with small masses, the fine tuning of the mass. So roughly this happens as follows, and I'm going to state my logic in the wrong order given that choice of lambdas, but doing it in the correct order doesn't change the conclusion. So the group at node 1, with coupling lambda 1, has NF equal to NC. It has the same number of flavors as colors. And Seiberg showed years ago that such a QCD theory enjoys a quantum modification of its moduli space. So where normally the determinant of M minus the baryon, BB tilde, would vanish in QCD with that number of flavors just as a group theoretic identity. In this theory, there's a modified right-hand side, det M minus BB tilde is lambda to the 2NC. So if we choose the mesonic branch, and I'll come back to that later, then det M is lambda to the 2NC, and taking M to have equal eigenvalues, it's easy to see that the quartic couplings in the superpotential, in particular that one, just act to generate quark masses for the quarks going between node 2 and 3. So this di dynamically generates a mass of order h lambda 1 squared for the flavors uh, of node 3, actually for all but the last flavor. And that last flavor, coming from node 4, receives instead a contribution to its superpotential from the Euclidean brain wrapping one of the unoccupied nodes of the quiver. So there were two talks yesterday by Blumenhagen and uh, Uranga that discussed stringy instantons coming from Euclidean D-brains. In some circumstances, these modify the superpotential. The relevant quiver diagram for a Euclidean brain wrapping node 5 is the one shown there, where alpha and beta are strings, Gnor strings, stretching from the instanton to the space-filling brain. And if you integrate those out, you see that this kind of extended quiver generates precisely the kind of mass term I wrote in the right circumstances, where you orient a fold so that there's a, an orientifold plane going through node 5. So in any case, uh, in the regime where h lambda 1 squared is less than m, less than lambda 3, the resulting theory at node 3 is roughly SQCD with nf greater than nc and less than 3 halves nc. That is in the regime where it's been shown to have metastable Susie breaking vacua. Now you can go back and justify that my assumption that we should be on the mesonic branch of node 1 is stable when we expand around the non-supersymmetric vacuum, at least to the best of our ability to check. Uh, that is, there's no evident local instability to move to the baryonic branch at node 1, where the quark masses would relax to zero and the vacuum would become unstable. The full quartic W is crucial in doing this. Now, the reason I went through this admittedly rather ugly model, there are three, it has three interesting features. First of all, all mass scales have been generated dynamically. So roughly speaking, the one thing you could complain about in ISS, the fine-tuned small mass, uh, has been retrofitted in the language of Dine, Thing, and Silverstein. So the model is completely natural. Uh, secondly, this model comes automatically, because of the string theory quiver, uh, with a quartic superpotential that 
turns into a quadratic in the meson field of the magnetic dual. Uh, in terms of the original ISS model, this deformation breaks the R symmetry. And that could be a good feature if one is interested in model building. And a very similar feature was pointed out in a different model by Kitano, Oguri, and Okuchi. And thirdly, and this was my original motivation, there was a relatively simple dual geometry for these models based on a deformation of this modified conifold xy cubed equals ew, where you can really propose concrete gravity duals involving wrap d5 brains and anti d3 brains. But I should admit our understanding is, is very incomplete at the present of to what extent this gravity dual recaptures features that are similar to the weak GN model. OK, in my last few minutes, um, I'd like to switch subjects and talk about sequestering. So let me tell you what it is and then tell you why I'm talking about it. This is an idea uh, to help solve the following problem. In gravi gravity-mediated SUSY breaking in general, uh, squark and slepton masses of the MSSM arise from terms that couple the squark superfields, QI and QJ there, to X. These are Planck suppressed terms in the Kalo potential. And X is the field that has the dominant SUSY breaking F term. So X's theta squared component is an F term whose VED is roughly 10 to the 11 GeV squared. And if you just plug into that superpotential with some general CIJ, which is some flavor matrix that mixes the generations, you'll find that indeed you generate TEV scale squark masses just by dimensional analysis. Uh, but the, t the last 20 years of, of spectacular um, lack of new signatures, okay, lack of EDMs, lack of real evidence for dimension six operators, lack of new sources for FCNCs, has led to a mystery. Uh, most people would say that if such a model describes nature, the matrix CIJ must, to good approximation, be delta IJ. Okay, there are other ways that you could go about fixing these problems, but this is one of the dominant ideas. So why would a general flavor matrix be the identity matrix to high precision? And the idea of sequestering was proposed by Randall and Sundram um, in a paper that you're not, is not the one you're thinking of, in 1998, uh, to solve this problem. Okay, so they advocated a scenario where due to locality and the extra dimensions and the spatial dimension of SUSY breaking from standard model brains, the dangerous dimension six terms in K would simply be absent. The X field would live on one brain, the standard model on another, and the communication would be sufficiently weak to sequester away or remove those terms. Okay, now that would remove all the soft masses, which we don't want to do, but they had another brilliant idea, which, which is called anomaly mediation, and using either that, which has its own problems, or some other mechanism, gauge genome mediation, high-scale gauge mediation, mirage mediation, um, you can generate flavor-blind squark masses. Now, I'm not going to worry about the model building. I'm just going to worry about the first assertion here. Um, can one sequester? Can one find string compactifications where SUSY is broken, but these dimension six Planck suppressed operators are absent? This is a UV-sensitive question, so string theory is required. And in fact, Dine et al. have argued very convincingly in many cases that the answer is no, that this doesn't go in string theory. In fact, I even wrote a paper saying that myself. But, but anyway, in recent work with McAllister and Sundram, we revisited this in the context of exactly the kinds of states I described to you. Susie breaking at the end of a warped throat where the low scale comes from the warping. And we conclude that in fact, breaking can robustly be sequestered under some assumptions uh, from the standard model as long as you put the gut brains or the standard model brains out of the throat in the bulk of the Calabia. And the basic intuition, which is all I have time to give, falls from ADS-CFT duality and uses the CFT language. Okay. So we should think of SUSY breaking at the end of a warped throat as ADS-CFT or gauge gravity dual to some approximate CFT, which starts at some high scale with an approximately conformal theory, runs from lambda UV, the high scale, to some low scale lambda IR, and then confines and breaks SUSY. And in CFT language, we're interested or worried about couplings that couple operators of the CFT O to the squark fields, Q dagger and Q, with some coefficient C. Now, in a CFT, in general, O will have some anomalous dimension. And the coefficient C of this coupling will run with the renormalization group between the UV and the IR scales. So if O has some anomalous dimension gamma, on top of what you would have naively guessed from weak coupling dimensional analysis, this coefficient will scale like the ratio of the infrared and UV scales to the gamma power. This is interesting because it means for order one anomalous dimensions, 
which you might think are generic and strongly coupled CFT. And for normal choices of that ratio, intermediate scale and gut or flank scale, this could kill the unwanted couplings to high precision. Now, in gravity dual language, there's a clear interpretation of what I'm saying. Uh, the hierarchy between the IR and UV scales translates into the requirement that the throat length in units of ADS radii be a few, okay, to generate the hierarchy between intermediate and Planck scale. The conformal dimension of the operator O that was entering in the coupling there maps to the KK mass of the gravity mode dual to O via the GKPW map. And then the suppression of C is exactly the Yukawa fall off of the propagator of a dual gravity mode of a given mass or conformal dimension traveling up the throat to talk to the standard model. Now, for this to not just be a curiosity or a possibility, but something that we can realize, we're left with a question. Namely, is it common for strongly coupled CFTs of the sort I've invoked not to have non chiral operators of dimension 2 that could appear there as the dangerous O and could couple to SUSY breaking, but instead to have only non chiral operators of dimension greater than or equal to about 3? Now, unfortunately, the answer is no, at least in the known example. Okay, if the CFT has any global symmetry group G, then the supermultiplet of the G conserved currents, uh, first of all, has protected conformal dimension because its charge is protected, and secondly, has a component whose dimension is precisely 2 uh, and roughly looks like X dagger TA X, or TA are the symmetry generators, and X are the, the fields of the conformal field theory. So immediately, you're left with a question. Many of the ADS CFT examples have such currents, in fact, probably all the well-known ones. So why doesn't this couple to the squarks, couple to Susie breaking, and kill us? And for this, we had to resort to a theorem proved by Schmaltz and Sundrum. It takes about five lines to prove, but I won't prove it here, which is that if G is such a symmetry, but is not explicitly broken by the CFT dynamics that lead to the confinement in Susie breaking, if it's preserved, then the Susie breaking F components of any such operators vanish. So while the sequestering breaks down and that such couplings are present, they don't transmit soft terms. So such operators do not harm sequestering. And in common examples, all non-chiral operators, which aren't protected in this way by being parts of currents, do have dimensions larger than three due to the large anomalous dimensions from strong dynamics. In particular, the first example we looked at, okay, the exact SUSY breaking by anti-D3 brains in the warp to form conifold, satisfies all the letters and requirements of our theorem. And my conclusion is, hence, such SUSY breaking is sequestered from any realization of the standard model in the bulk of the Calabi outspace. Now, this is one example of a stringy feature that seems natural, that was thought to be unnatural previously without studying such strongly coupled states. Uh, it could conceivably be relevant at LHC that I wouldn't bet on it. Um, but could there be other such phenomena? Could they be relevant at LHC? Uh, I'll end with that question. Thanks. Questions, please. Oh, please. In, in the ISS, uh, if you want the realization of ISS in the compact Calabria, the lambdas could be uh, functions of the moduli. Have you thought about how will that change the picture? No, good. So, I mean, if you really wanted to use ISS in a compact Calabria, there would be two questions. One is stabilizing the mass. The other is stabilizing the lambdas. And um, in, in this, we locally take care of the mass. It's dynamical in the open string theory, and we fixed it. Uh, I do not know, you know what you do to stabilize the lambdas, except to say that I imagine it wouldn't look much different than, than what one does in scenarios with just the anti-brain states I mentioned. One would need some, some way with a super potential or KOR potential correction of stabilizing the dynamical lambda. That could give rise to a runaway or something. If, uh... Well, like I said, I think it's not different or, or, or easier, easier or harder than, than stabilizing other methods like flux-based Susie breaking or the anti-D3 brains. I think uh, it wouldn't necessarily run away, but you'd have to have some little mechanism to stabilize the lambda. More questions? No? Okay. Hi, Shamit. So just to put your talk and Michael's together, uh, you need a rather specific Euler potential for the sequestering to work. And uh, I, th I think the answer to this must be yes, but 
it always worried me a little bit that uh, has one accounted for the warping appropriately in writing down that super that, okay. can that give rise to corrections that, that deals. so so in fact i didn't go into the whole story which is the bulk of our paper which is going through stringy KOR potentials that dine went through dine carefully showed that they do not sequester and we need to reconcile our story with his story okay and his simplest example was in fact the toroidal compactification of string theory with some number of three brains arguing that distant three brains don't sequester and if you go through his analysis and go through our analysis, you conclude that at large GN, if you crank up the coupling in the torus, um, that k potential is protected by supersymmetry. So his answer is exact. But we're saying it should sequester. So what gives? And what gives is, in fact, the cross-couplings he found are precisely those of the protected currents, the G currents I mentioned, between the two stacks of brains. So I think existing string k potentials are completely consistent with my argument. The breakdown of sequestering that was seen when at least you get to this warp limit, can be interpreted in terms of communication due to these protected currents. But as I argued, those won't harm um, the SUSY breaking properties. Thanks. More questions? Okay, please. This is just a confusion, but those G symmetries are symmetries of the throat, but not symmetries of the whole Calabi Yao. Absolutely true. So how do they protect? So how do they protect you? Yeah, yeah, good. So, so they're, they're they're of course broken explicitly in the UV by by details of the compactification. But the, the question here is is um, is to what extent the breaking at the end of the throat breaks the G symmetries. So, for instance, in this warp deform conifold case, the SU2 times SU2 times U1 symmetry of T11 is completely preserved by um, by the Klebanoff Strassler capping of the throat. It's broken in a certain way by the antibrains, but more detailed analysis shows that you don't have to worry. And while it's true that there's UV breaking by the Calabi Al, that is in no way tied to the supersymmetry breaking. So the, the SUSY breaking theorem of Schmaltzen syndrome by locality, if you want, is protected. Does it answer your question or not? Okay. I don't I wonder whether renormalization in the hidden sector, which gives you the anomalous dimension there, whether it has other effects on other soft terms which will invalidate some of these claims. Having in mind a picture like the recent BU paper. I, I could, uh, yeah. Okay, so there's this interesting paper of Cohen and, and Schmaltz. And I haven't thought carefully about, for instance, whether unification predictions would be completely ruined by, by such, such, a, you know, such a thing. I don't think the prediction of the absence of those dimension six operators would go away. But I think it's true if you have a very strongly coupled hidden sector, standard unification predictions might have to be revisited. They may be weakened. And I think that's what the BU authors were concluding. So I, th I think your comment is well taken. Okay. I don't see. If no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. The next speaker is Konstantin Zaremba.